Are we really supposed to reign and rule on this earth with Jesus right now? Let's find out. Hey everybody, welcome to Behold and Sing. I'm so glad to be with you again this week. I want to address something that was stirred in me a couple of days ago as I heard a couple of young ministers uh, together on a podcast, and they were talking about a transition that was happening in both of their lives. One was a little bit deeper into the transition than the other, but they were both experiencing something similar. And, and what they said in their discussion was that God had spoken to each of them over a period of time and had asked them to step out of full-time ministry and into full-time business. Now, when someone says, God told me to do something, I I think, who am I to argue? And so I, I don't have a question about whether God did or didn't. That's between them and him. But the scripture that they were using as they were discussing this and, and verifying that this was a move and a work of the Lord, it, it made me question things just a bit. So I want to give you that scripture. They were talking about being kings and priests in the earth and that in their view, being a priest was being a full-time minister, being a king operating in a kingly anointing would be to be in the business world, to be out there making money, doing things in, um, the realm that a lot of people like to call the seven mountains, which that's not even a a true doctrine, but we won't go there right now. Don't have time to refute that whole thing. But that was their premise that because they are kings and priests, that they had spent a lot of time in the priest ministry, full-time ministry, both of them for, for a couple of decades, but now they were moving into a role, a role as kings where they were going to be in business and they were going to operate in a different anointing. So let's just look at the scriptures. I don't want to argue with these men. I really don't. But when there are things put forth as doctrines and as verifications of lifestyles, and it's not quite lining up with truth, I I do have an issue with it and I do feel an obligation to speak about it. Okay. So the verse they were using was Revelation 1, 6, and it says, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So let me back up and, and bring this into context. This is, this is John, who is beginning his letter to the seven churches, which is what the book of Revelation is. It is actually a long letter, okay? And it says in verse 4, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. So he's saying this letter is not just from me, but it is from God who is, was, and is, and is to come. It's from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, as I look this up, because that's what I do, I I look into words and and I want to see what the original language said. So the first thing that I saw was that this word kings in the original language was kingdom. Okay, there's, there's a vast difference. And then I began to look at what other translations said. And almost all of them, with the exception of the King James and the New King James, said He has made us a kingdom, comma, priests unto God. Now that's vastly different. He's made us a kingdom. 
which means that we are subjects in his kingdom, servants in his kingdom, vastly different from he has made us kings as if we are the rulers. He is the king of the kingdom. Okay, there's one king in this kingdom, and that's Jesus. He's made us a kingdom, comma, and priests unto our God. Priests who serve God first and foremost, but serve man horizontally in the name of Jesus. Okay, that's what we do. That's what we do as brothers and sisters in the Lord. We minister to one another. We do serve as priests. We're preaching the gospel to the lost. We are expressing truth, teaching, and and training disciples. We're to make disciples in all nations. All of that is part of the priesthood that we are a part of, not the Levitical priesthood, but, but the priesthood as men and women of God, those who are born again, bought by the precious blood of Jesus. To whom it says, be all glory and dominion. He has the dominion. He said, all power has been given unto me. All power as in authority. All authority is his. Sometimes in in today's world especially, and I, I really don't think this is new. I think it's just being repackaged. But people want to grasp for things that are not ours to have. They want to be kings and Priests, they want to rule and reign and have dominion. And you might say, well, well, yeah, but didn't doesn't the Bible say that we're we're going to reign with him? Well, let's just look. In uh, Revelation chapter five, it it says this again. It's it's talking about, I'm just gonna read the whole the whole chapter. It says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book. Okay, so God's sitting on the throne and he has in his right hand a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. We all know about the seals. All right, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and 20 elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song saying, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us, bought us, purchased us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. This is the same exact verbiage. He's made us a kingdom of priests, a kingdom, comma, priests unto our God, however however you want to grammatically look at it. And we shall reign on the earth. We shall, future, we shall reign on the earth. There is a reign to come, but friend, it's, it's not what is being purported by many doctrines today. So I'm, I'm going to go to Revelation 20. We're going to look at one more time that this, is, this phraseology is used. Chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid 
hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, praise God, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. After that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. These are those who were killed during the tribulation because they refused the mark. For the word of God, which had not worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Again, a future reign. But let me go back and show you something that, that I didn't know until I started digging into this. In Exodus chapter 19, you might find this interesting. Let me turn on back. Exodus chapter 19. I should play the Jeopardy music here. Doo, 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 doo. All right. In, in chapter 19, the children of Israel have come out of Egypt. They've come across the Red Sea. They've, they've moved into the wilderness. And it says that they have come to Mount Sinai. And God has called Moses up into the mountain because he wants to deliver a message to the people. So let's see what is that message. Exodus 19, chapter, uh, let's just look at verse um, 3. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. That's beautiful. Now, therefore, because I did this, because I rescued you on the wings of eagles, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me, a, a precious possession is what that means. Above all people, for all the earth is mine. God's expressing his authority again. And ye shall be unto me, here it is, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you will speak to the children of Israel. Amazing. The first thing that God says to them is, I brought you out lovingly unto myself. And what I'm asking is that you obey my voice, obey my words, and obey my covenant. And if you do, you will be a precious possession. Now, do you hear that? Possession. The New Testament tells us we have been bought with a price, not with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. We are his possession. Possessions don't have autonomy. Possessions don't have the right to do whatever they want. So let's remember that first of all. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Folks, think about Moses. He was given rulership over the children of Israel as they came into the wilderness and they were on their way to the promised land, which is a really only about an 11-day journey if you just go straight there. But because of their disobedience, it took them 40 years. We all know that. I'm not going to try to, to, to address that whole story. But here's Moses. God calls him up the mountain. He gives him a message. Moses goes down and he delivers the message. The people answer. Moses goes back up to tell God the answer. Then God begins to give Moses the rules of life. 
as it were, that he starts out in, in chapter 20, the, the Ten Commandments, but then he goes on and, and he gives them instruction for building an altar. He gives them instruction for how to treat servants. He, he gives them laws, what to do if someone is violent toward a neighbor, what to do if someone steals an ox, what to do if you accidentally kill an ox. He's giving them laws of human relation how to live right. So you will be my precious treasure, my precious possession, and you'll be a kingdom of priests. And what's the first thing he does? He gives them instruction how to live with one another. Because what is it? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. This is not about ruling and reigning. It's about being priests, servants, one to another, living righteously one to another. But think about Moses. He was ruling over these people. However, Moses was not doing it in his own strength. God was constantly up the mountain, Moses. I'll give you instruction down the mountain, Moses. Give it to the people. Up the mountain, Moses. I'm going to tell you more down the mountain, Moses. Tell it to the people. Moses did not try to act on his own strength, his own wisdom, his own knowledge. In fact, the one time that Moses did go outside of God's specific instruction, you remember, The first time he hit the rock with the rod and water poured out. The second time they were in a bind and they were without water, God spoke to Moses and said, speak to the rock. He shifted it. He changed it. He wanted to reveal another part of himself to the people. But Moses, because he was frustrated and angry, hit the rock. Because of his disobedience, He was not allowed to go into the promised land. God took him up into a high mountain and let him see it, but he didn't get to go in. Ruling and reigning with God is not like ruling and reigning in our society. It's about being a priest. It's about being a servant. I want to go to 1 Peter chapter 2. Because this, this shows us again. Remember, he said you would be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Well, that, that reminds us of this verse. Because the Old Testament and the New Testament are, are one. They're the word. Okay, so let me get to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom is coming is unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also. As lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. He he goes on to give them instruction for what it means to be that holy priesthood. Verse 9, he says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. There's that kingly term again that people want to grasp and want to live out today on the earth when it's not ours to have yet. And it's not ours to have in the way that the world portrays it. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar People, there's that word peculiar again, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Verse 12, having your conversation, your lifestyle honest among the Gentiles. He starts to talk about submitting ourselves to the ordinances of men. In verse 16, he says, 
as being free, but not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Folks, reigning with Jesus is about being a servant with him. He who knew no sin became sin for us, the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate laying aside of his divine rights in order to purchase us with his own blood. The elders, the 24 elders who had the position in in the area of the throne with God, with the creatures, with with the, the heavenly angels all around them, and yet what did they do? They did not sit upon thrones as rulers, they knelt, they bowed down, and they cried out and cast their their crowns at the feet of the one who deserves our praise. Will there be a, a ruling and reigning in the millennium? Absolutely, but not the way that we think. First of all, you have to remember who will be ruled over, quote unquote. There will be a whole bunch of natural people who made it through the tribulation. Not every human is killed in the tribulation. Read it. Many will live through it, but who are they? The most stubborn, the most rebellious, the most God-hating people will have made it through the tribulation. And they are not going to be happy to see Jesus return to rule and reign with a rod of iron. And they're not going to be happy that he's taking some of us, his servants, and placing us in a place as Moses was to teach them, to train them, to command them that, you know what, this is how you're going to live. You're going to live righteously. But we're not going to rule. It doesn't say we will rule with a rod of iron. It says Jesus will. We will rule the same way that Moses did. Up the mountain, Jesus, receive instruction, come back to the people, deliver the instruction. Up the mountain, down the mountain. This thing that everyone wants to grasp and wants to try to bring into today is, first of all, reserved for tomorrow. Secondly, it is to reign as a servant reigns, not to lord it over people and certainly not to rule with our own thoughts and our own knowledge, but to be servants, priests who gather from the one the lamb who's the only one worthy to open the scroll to to see what is written thereon to to walk as his servant doing his bidding but that's not for today People are constantly trying to take what is for tomorrow and bring it into today, and you can't do that. Because first of all, that's pride. Second of all, that's disobedience. It's foolish. It's what Adam and Eve did in the garden. They wanted more knowledge than they had. They thought something had been withheld from them, and they wanted to grasp it and bring it into the now, and it caused the fall of mankind. They walked with God in the cool of the day and he was teaching them and training them, giving them the knowledge little by little that he wanted them to have. But the serpent came in and convinced them that God was hiding something from them, holding something back. And if they would just take part of this fruit that was forbidden unto them, that all of that knowledge would be opened up to them. And with that knowledge, the ability to rule over an earth that they had already been given dominion over, it's not kingdom now. Listen, I am saved. 
when I cried out on the name of the Lord and asked Jesus to be my Lord, to be my Savior. He came, he, he birthed in me a rebirth. I was born again, saved, delivered, set free. That's, that is a past tense that, that is a present tense and a forever tense. I am saved. But I'm also being transformed by the renewing of my mind in, this, in the scripture, in the word. That is an ongoing, continuing salvation. I am saved. I am being saved. In other words, what does the Bible say? To work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You can't work out regeneration. You can't work out being justified by the blood of Jesus, but you can work out sanctification. That's separating and and setting yourself apart to be holy as he is holy. To be not conformed to the world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the ongoing work. But then there is a coming salvation when this body shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. It will put off immortality. It will will put off mortality, put on immortality. It'll be transformed into this glorified body. But I can't grasp that in the now. I've told you that before, but I, I, I feel it needs repeated. In the same way, the kingdom, Jesus is the king of the kingdom. He's who we are to reveal. He's who we are to preach and put our focus on and our concentration and our devotion toward. He's the king of this kingdom. When we preach the kingdom, we're preaching the king. Do you understand? We are in the kingdom. When we're born again, we become citizens of the kingdom. We're in the kingdom. We're also, as we're being transformed by the renewing of our mind, we're learning kingdom principles and we're being required and and pushed by the Holy Spirit to live kingdom principles, to live right with one another. But there is the the coming entrance into the physical kingdom with the king when he returns to rule and reign on the earth. That's the completion. I can't grasp for the things of that future living with him on the earth. I can't grasp those things and pull them into the now, no matter how many people on YouTube tell you you can. It's illegal. It's wrong. It will produce the same things in you that it produced in Adam and even when they tried to go for the knowledge that was not theirs. If you try to live in an authority, a ruling, and a reigning on the earth now that you see that is provided for you in the kingdom of God for eternity, it's, it's going to produce death. It's going to produce the opposite of what you are straining and striving for. We see what happens to those who strain and strive for that which is not theirs to have without having a true relationship with the one who purchased those things. When Jesus said, many will say in that day, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do mighty wonders and works? Did we not cast out devils? There's this whole list of things that people want to grasp for. Yes, we're to cast out devils. Yes, we're to preach the kingdom. But he said, I'll say, depart from me, you who work iniquity, for I never knew you. To know him as Moses did in his presence, then only do and say what he tells us to do and say. Not grasping after authority that is not ours. He has all authority given to 
him. We operate in his name, according to his word, at the moving of the spirit. I cannot take dominion over this planet. I can't take dominion over my town. There's a lot of people that aren't going to like me saying that. I can't take dominion over my school, my neighborhood. That's what witchcraft does. Tries to control. I will simply know him. Be with him. Know him. Be with him. And then obey his voice as he told them in Exodus. Keep his covenant. Be a kingdom of priests serving others in his name. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give to you in the name of Jesus. What did they make clear? If you think that this is because of anything that we did, you're wrong. This is, this is him. This is, this is Jesus. This is the one that you crucified. It's by his name and by faith in his name that this man is made well that you see dancing and leaping and praising God. It's not the believer's authority. I don't possess authority. He has all authority. His name has all authority. If I will simply live and do what he asks me to do each and every day, I will be as a priest ministering unto others in his name, delivering his message, doing his work and his will, not grasping for things that are reserved for the future, not grasping for things as the world tells me they are to be. Judas thought that Jesus was supposed to rule and reign and take control of the government. Seven mountains. He was sorely deceived and and so much so that he opened himself to be possessed of the devil and to deliver Jesus over to the hands that would crucify him. Because he thought The Messiah would rule. He will. But there are times and there are seasons and there are limitations in each time and in each season. And there are things that we are allowed to do and that we are not allowed to do. That We are allowed to desire and not allowed to desire. How do you find them? You open this Bible and you read and you ask him to open the scriptures to you. And to show you, and you keep things in contact. You don't cherry pick. You compare scripture with scripture. What do we see? Revelation. A couple of translations say kings and priests. However, if we go back to Exodus, we see kingdom of priests. The Bible just translated itself. I know this has been a hard message, and and I'm sorry, but I, I believe that there are There are many who are being led away from truth. They think they're being led into something deeper and something better and something more powerful. But what is better and deeper and more powerful than Jesus himself? That's all I want. I just want to know him. His resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed. His death, if I might partake of the resurrection. In Him, I live and move and have my being. That's my cry. I am not perfect at it by a million trillion miles. That is the direction I'm going in, and I believe that's the direction you want to go into. So, Father, I just ask that you would bless those who are viewing today, and I ask that you would take these words and only pull out to their memory, to their heart, the things that they need. 
God, make it clear to them. Give them wisdom and understanding of your scripture. Help them, Lord, to live unto you each and every day in the name of Jesus. Thank you.